morning dignitaries, participants, guests, academicians, and people from press. On behalf of Institute of Public Enterprise and Federation of Telangana Andhra Pradesh Chamber of Commerce and Industry, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this distinguished lecture on inclusive growth. Inclusive growth is a concept that advances equitable opportunities for economic participants during economic growth with benefits incurred by every section of the society. The definition of inclusive growth implies direct link between the macroeconomics and microeconomic determinants of the economy and economic growth. Inclusive growth basically means making sure everyone is included in growth regardless of their economic class, gender, sex, disability, and religion. Inclusive growth approach takes on long-term perspective and the focus is on the productive employment rather than merely direct income redistributions as a means of increased income for excluding the group. With this welcome note, I'm very happy that all our dignitaries have already been on the dais. I request Sri Modi to present a bouquet to the honorable speaker for today, Professor Thorat, Chairman, Indian Council of Social Science Research, Ministry of HRD, Government of India, New Delhi. I request Sri Modi to present a bouquet to our President, Sri K. Madhavarao Garu, President, Board of Governors, Institute of Public Enterprise, Hyderabad. I request Sri Modi, President, Federation of Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, Chamber of Commerce, to, pre to present the welcome address. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Professor Sukhdev Thorat, Chairman, Indian Council of Social Science and Research, Ministry of HRD, Government of India. Dr. R.K. Mishra, Director, Institute of Public Enterprise. Uh, Professor Rao, my colleagues on the dais, participants, distinguished guests and invitees, press and electronic media, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you for today's lecture meet on inclusive growth. I extend my special welcome to Professor Thorat, Chairman Indian Council of Social Science uh, Research, New Delhi. I thank Institute of Public Enterprise for taking initiative in organizing such event and hope that this kind of event would be held again in future. Our today's guest, Professor Sukhdev Thorath, is an eminent economist, highly ranked in the national and international governance and academic world. He has done extensive study on social activism and created awareness about the marginalized section in the Indian society. The topic of inclusive growth to be addressed by Professor Thorath is in the right direction. I am happy to mention that FAPC is working closely with educational institutes and universities by bonding strong linkage with industry and academic institutes for the benefit of both. The industry can utilize the knowledge hub by giving the industry-centric projects to the students and in turn students and academicians understand the present need of the industry. This is one more step to take this process forward and we look forward to a lot of interaction in future. The chamber can also be a bridge between government and academic institutes for various surveys and research. I take this opportunity to mention that FAPC has signed a MOU with IPE to carry out activities in the field of research in social and economic and all other related sectors of business and industry. I am thankful to IPE for their support and endeavor. We all are aware that the inclusive growth is necessary for sustainable development and equitable distribution of wealth and prosperity. Achieving inclusive growth is the biggest challenge in the country like India because majority of people living in rural India 
the challenge is to take the level of growth to all section of the society and to all parts of the country it is also known that several social political and economic factors need to be tackled for sustaining a high rate of growth as well as to make the growth inclusive according to world economic forum in its inclusive growth and development report of 2015 which analyzed data from 120 112 countries stated that india ranked in the bottom half of the 38 countries that comprise the reports lower middle income bracket which included egypt ghana ukraine iran and nigeria among others this category identifies countries that have enough income to lift much of the population above subsistence level but are still struggling to do so india ranked 37 out out of 38 countries in fiscal transfers 36 in social protection and 38 in small business ownership its inefficiency in addressing wealth and income disparity means that india is yet to embrace inclusive growth and development for all its citizen the country ranks on the lower end of most parameters be it access to education sanitation health coverage and infrastructure however it is ranked well on business and political ethics the report suggested that india must take further action to ensure that the growth process is broad based in order to expand a small middle class and reduce the sh- share of population living on lesser income however i feel we have done well in terms of access to finance for business development and uh, real economy investment rapid growth in rural economy well planned and targeted urban growth infrastructure development reforms in education ensuring future energy needs a healthy public private partnership intent to secure inclusivity making all section of so- society equal shareholders in growth all about a uh, good government will ensure that india achieves what it deserves the inclusiveness involves many attributes which includes opportunity capability access and security the opportunity attributes focuses on generating more opportunities to the people and focuses on increasing their income the capability attributes concentrates on providing the means for people to create or enhance their capability in order to exploit available opportunities the access attributes focuses on providing the means to bring opportunities and capabilities together the security attributes provides the means for people to protect themselves against a temporary or permanent loss of livelihood together of all the inclusive growth is a process in which economic growth measured by a sustained expansion in gdp contributes to an enlargement of the scale and scope for all four dimensions i am proud to inform that fapc is ushering into its century centenary year and has started preparation to celebrate the centenary in befitting manners fapc has been serving the industry and trade tirelessly and representing telangana and andhra pradesh on matter of interest to industry trade and commerce be it formulation of policies representing industry in various government committees bringing issues to the notice of concerned officials in my tenure as president it will be my concerted endeavor to preserve fapc's place of pride as credible and visible representative of trade and industry in the state of telangana and andhra pradesh it will be my vision to explore new avenues and emerge as a knowledge chamber for excellence in the coming year it is my goal to pursue a new direction for fapc i am confident that in the near future study reports on various subjects will be published for the benefit of the members and which also shall serve as a reference guide to the government departments i once again welcome you all especially our learned speakers professor sukhdev thorat who will enlighten us 
his rich experience and provi provide valuable ideas to inclusive growth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Modi, for the brief uh, welcome and also a lot of insight about the industry and what FAPSI is doing uh, as a part of academic and uh, industry collaboration. It's my pleasure to introduce our president, Shri K. Madhav Rao Garu, to all the dignitaries here and participants. Shri Madhav Rao Garu, president, board of governors and chairman, executive committee of the Institute of Public Enterprise, joined the Indian administrative service in the year 1962. He was the Chief Secretary, Government of Andhra Pradesh and State Election Commissioner, Government of Andhra Pradesh. He also served as advisor to the Government of Bihar. He was the Chairman for High Power Committee for Urban Cooperative Banks, which is a, which has been initiated by Reserve Bank of India and Director Central Board of Reserve Banks of India and Member of Board for Financial Supervision by the RBI. During his tenure between 1979 to 1997, he served as secretary of various departments such as General Administration, Panchayat Raj, Rural Development, Food and Agriculture, Irrigation, Principal Secretary, Special Chief Secretary of Finance Department of Government of Andhra Pradesh. He was a district collector for a period of three years in Warangal. And he was also a managing director of Leather Industries Development Corporation of Andhra Pradesh and director of social welfare and was a managing director of the SC and ST Finance Corporation Government of Andhra Pradesh. From 2004, he has been full-time activist in the area of affirmative actions, good governance and economic reforms. He is currently holding as a chairman of the Mahila Abhivruddhi Society based in Hyderabad from 2007 till date. This society champions the cause of women for the self-help groups. He is also the trustee of the international organization by name South Institute for Public Policy and Action based in Hyderabad. We have immense pleasure that you have uh, come here, sir. May I request you to address the gathering, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Modi, and uh, thanks, uh, my friend, Ms. Thorat. Uh, there is uh, enough introduction about the subject. I would uh, continue at the point that you have mentioned about where India stands in this uh, effort at uh, the inclusive growth. I think you mentioned it is about 36. Now, are we happy with that? Are we any different from other countries in this uh, respect? The position is not comfortable, but is there a greater obligation cast on the state in India compared to other countries where who are occupying higher positions than India? Or are we still looking at the classical theory of Adam Smith, where all players will get their due because the forces of supply and demand will see that there is an equilibrium, near perfect equilibrium, barring a few glitches now and then. The labor will, will get its due. The owner of the capital will get his due. The various players in the economic activity will get their due because this markets, perfect markets, they are operated by an invisible hand to see that there is equ equilibrium. The invisible hand either has failed or never existed. As if it is existed and it wouldn't have failed, and assuming it still existed and it failed, why did it fail? Now, this affirmative action comes in the light of that failure or non existence of the invisible hand. This affirmative action is not peculiar to. India, it is peculiar to India in one respect. Articles 38 
and 39 of the Constitution prescribe that there should be no concentration of wealth and there is access to the income, opportunities and resources of the country to everybody. There should be political, economic and social equality. I have not seen anywhere a constitution outside India which mandates that the wealth distribution should be oriented towards equality. In other words, in India, there is a greater compulsion than any other country to have a better performance, but still we are at 36. And why is it happening? At the time of independence, the inequalities in India are much, much less compared to what it is today. Now we have different governments, different prime ministers, but the process has not really improved. How do we go about this inclusive affirmative action and inclusive growth? We don't fully trust the market, but there will be an intervention by the government. That intervention comes in the form of taxation and redistribution of wealth. Now, where do we stand on this front? Because there's a main instrument of redistribution is the taxation. Now, the, if you take the income tax rates, which is a major source of income for the government, which serves the purpose of redistribution, and which thus serves the purpose of affirmative action, India used to have uh, an income tax rate of 77% barring an area where it was more than 90% in one, one year. It came down to 30% in the last 20 years. From 77 we came down to 30%. The capitalist countries who are not bound by these articles 38-39 their taxation rates on income range from 64, lowest is 50 for a capitalist country like Canada. Another major instrument of redistribution is inheritance tax. A person earns his wealth, but at the time of his demise, the state takes a share of that wealth for redistribution. Inheritance tax, tax is there in a number of countries except some 13 countries. And India is one of those miserable 13 countries. The major source you have and you give it up. We had at some time small estate tax 2.5%. Now the inheritance tax in Japan is 55%, South Korea 55, France is 40, 44, UK 40%, US 40, India nil. Damn Article 38-39 will have no inheritance tax. Let the rich get richer and bequeath that riches to their children. You have a number of other uh, um, indicators I will not trouble you because the chief uh, guest will do that job. So the, it's a kind of situation where an obligation cast upon the state is doing worse than capitalist countries who are not votaries of the so-called affirmative action. but turned into practitioners because of practical considerations. 
If you don't have affirmative action, what happens? There will be unrest. So there are two routes to uh, this uh, to this problem. Create an unrest and there is a revolutionary route, there is a violent route. The second is a, an organized conscious effort by the government to see the inequalities do not go to a level where there will be such a violence. Now that's, that's where the affirmative action has been there and today there is hardly any c country which does not have this affirmative action. The name may be different, the scope may be different, the, ex the quantum of uh, relief to the deserving poor may be different. And interestingly, the best countries are in this regard the capitalist countries which carry the tag proudly. But we carry the tag of socialist state and we are at 36 percent no matter what the constitution says. Now this is the issue.